purposes. And since Commissioner Dave is recusing, um, we're not going to ask if it's an excused absence, correct? Um, special meetings don't, I mean, we still do work calls, but they don't, yeah, we don't need to identify what it is. Okay, just making sure. Okay, I All think right. we're ready. Let me know when you're ready to push the button. Yes, it's ready. All right, let's do it. Hang on a second, somebody's banging at my back door. All right, we'll give uh, Vice Chair Melman a moment. There is a truck outside my window doing some kind of 17 point turn, if you're wondering what that beeping is. I'm about to start now. It appears it was my neighbor's uh, door that was being knocked upon. It just sounds like mine because they're so, mm. so close. So ready? Yep. All right. Hello, everybody. Start the webinar now. Good. All right. Good evening. Let's call to order this Sunnyvale Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting of August 1st at 6.02 p.m. Before we get started, I'd like to remind commissioners of some procedural items for this meeting. During the meeting, participants should remain muted when not speaking. If participants have a question or comment, please use the raise hand feature. Speakers will be called upon to speak one at a time. A random order voice vote will be administered by city staff for each vote. This Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting is being conducted utilizing teleconferencing and electronic means as allowed by Government Code Subdivision 54953E and resolution 1089-21, most recently reaffirmed by the City Council on July 12, 2022. Members of the public may provide audio public comment by connecting to the teleconference meeting online or by telephone. Use the raise hand feature to request to speak star nine on a telephone. Teleconference meeting details are available on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting agenda. Captions are available to viewers accessing this meeting via Zoom. Captions can be displayed or hidden using the live transcript button. Comments on matters not on the agenda are, must be submitted prior to the time the chair calls the item for oral communications. There will be no oral communications this evening because this is a special meeting. Comments on agenda items must be submitted prior to the time the chair closes the public hearing on the agenda item. Speakers are requested to keep their comments to no more than three minutes and time limits will be enforced. Guidelines are posted on the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission meeting agenda. City staff, may we have the roll call, please? Commissioner Haithman. Present. Chair Mellinger. Present. Vice Chair Mailman. Present. Commissioner Dave is absent today. Commissioner uh, Beagle. Present. Commissioner Bonet. Here. Commissioner Owe. Present. So we have six uh, commissioner present and one absent. Very good. Next on the agenda, our only agenda item this evening, file 22-0791. Recommend to City Council the selection of the Mary Avenue underpass with jug handle option to be defined as the proposed project for the grade separation of crossing of the Caltrain tracks for the environmental review. Before we enter into this discussion, uh, colleagues, I have an announcement to make. Due to a conflict of interest, ownership of real property, I will need to recuse myself from Mary, the Mary Avenue underpass discussion as I own real property within 1,000 feet of the proposed underpass. 
As such, I will be handing the chairship over to Vice Chair Melman, who will chair the remainder of this meeting. Thank you all very much, and I will be logging off now. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mellinger does retain his ability to comment as a member of the public um, during the public commentary section of the, um, of the agenda item. Um, I would ask, is there a staff report regarding the, uh, what we are discussing is item number 220791. Uh, recommendation to the City Council of the Mary Avenue underpass. Um, is there a staff report? Uh, Chair, uh, Acting Chair Melman, I also am going to have to recuse myself because I own property within a thousand feet also. I was waiting for the proper to say that. But... Oh, sorry. <laughs> I forgot Commissioner Hafeman. So again, um, if you could recuse yourself and you will be um, put to the attendee section. And again, you can reserve uh, commentary for the public portion of the comments of the agenda. Thank you. Before we proceed, are there any other members of the commission which need to recuse themselves? All right. Seeing none, I will ask for a staff report on agenda item 220791 regarding the Mary Avenue underpass. Thank you, uh, Chair, Acting Chair Melman. Um, I am giving the staff report and presentation this evening. Uh, my name is Angela Obeso. I'm a principal transportation engineer in the traffic and transportation division, and I am the project manager for the Caltrain grade separation feasibility study. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, we're here tonight to talk about Mary Avenue. And I've got a presentation to show you some of the options that are uh, up for discussion this evening. Next slide. So just a little bit of background first. Uh, here's a map with North pointing up that shows the two existing at grade Caltrain crossings that we currently have in Sunnyvale. Uh, when we say at grade, that means that the railroad tracks and the local streets cross each other at the same elevation. Uh, tonight we're focusing on Mary Avenue. Uh, at the BPAC meeting on July 21st, we discussed and BPAC members took action on the Sunnyvale location. So folks that are interested in that can uh, go back to that recording. Next, please. The uh, feasibility study that we are working on right now began in 2017 and the project team started by looking at the entire range of types of grade separations that there could be. And what a grade separation is, is moving either the rail or the roadway or both so that they no longer cross at the same elevation. So uh, it evaluated the full range, either the train going up or down, the roadway going up and down, or some hybrid version of the two. Through an extensive uh, outreach, public outreach and stakeholder outreach process, those uh, options were narrowed down. And you'll see the, the two that are narrowed down for the Mary Avenue crossing tonight. Uh, in 2018, we brought the information, all of the different options and the pros and cons to city council, and we received their direction to move forward with the two options you're seeing tonight. Uh, since then, we've done some uh, analyses and refined the, the, the option designs, conceptual designs, and we had some delays due to COVID, but we are back on track now, and we are looking to complete the feasibility study this fall uh, culminating in this meeting with you guys. And then on uh, August 30th, excuse me, we are going to city council to ask them to select a preferred alternative. So that's what we're asking from the commission this evening is to make a recommendation to the city council for which option they should move forward with. And then whatever is selected this evening, will, or, I'm sorry, with council on August 30th, that option will move forward into the environmental phase we will also know, a we'll have a better idea of how much funding we will need to secure. And so staff will move forward with those two things. Next slide. 
the uh, overriding purpose of the grade separation projects is safety. Uh, by re removing the at-grade crossing of the rail with the local roadways, uh, you, you eliminate all of the potential for conflicts between the rail, the high speed, uh, uh, you know, the higher speed rails and the lower speed bicycles, pedestrians and vehicles on the local roadway. And we also know that with um, time, Caltrain expects to run more trains, which then creates more gate downtime, which, which creates more delays, uh, more noise, things like that. And so those are some of the uh, additional benefits of a grade separation. And also by grade separating these crossings, we help to achieve our city's goals of vision zero and sustainability. Next slide. This is a graphic that I borrowed from the Caltrain business plan. And this really shows us future, what the train tracks are going to look like as far as volumes of trains. So today, uh, the lighter blue numbers are the Caltrain numbers. And at the top, you see there that today, there's approximately 100 trains, Caltrain trains that run through this um, crossing every day, every weekday. And then with their business plan, they're projecting somewhere between 174 to 348 Caltrain trains per day, uh, weekday. That does not include freight trains, which is not captured here. It also doesn't include the 130 high-speed rail trains that are currently projected to come through here. So as you can see, by 2040, uh, Caltrain's projections show the number of trains crossing at Mary and Sunnyvale going up quite a bit. So that exacerbates the need, the safety and the delay needs for building grade separations now to get ahead of that. Next slide. So before we get into the details of the two options, just a quick look at you know, where we're at and where we're going. Uh, right now, we're in the last leg of the public outreach portion. Uh, we've been reaching out to the various potential stakeholders, property owners, business owners. Uh, we've had community meet, another round of community meetings in early June. There was an online survey that just closed last night <laughs> at midnight. And so we will uh, capture those results when we report out to city council. Uh, we had the, uh, the July 21st BPAC meeting where we talked about the Sunnyvale Avenue location with you guys. And um, our next goal is the city council meeting on August 30th, where we're asking them to select a preferred option. That preferred option then will move into environmental clearance phase. Mary Avenue will move forward first and uh, Sunnyvale Avenue will, will follow about a year later. We, are, we will continue our ongoing coordination with Caltrain to make sure that we have their staffing uh, all of our agreements in place so that it's seamless, that, that we can continue working with them without delay. And then we'll, we'll go into final design and construction of the Mary Avenue location first. So with that, uh, next slide, please. I think with that, we'll get into the uh, current alternatives. So the first option of Mary Avenue, and I, I want to uh, say up for, first that these are, because this is a feasibility study, these options are designed at a very conceptual level. So there's a lot of nuances that we will work out in final design, but this is intended to give you an idea of the impacts, potential impacts of each for comparison purposes. So this is the Mary Avenue underpass option and the geometry, the layout, the number of lanes, uh, turn pockets, all of that basically remains the same as is out there today with the exception of adding bike facilities through the intersection that where there's sharrows today. Uh, but the main difference here is that the entire intersection will be lowered about 20 to 25 feet below where it is today. The reason that we're lowering it is in order to have Mary Avenue go underneath the train tracks and the train tracks would stay at their existing elevation. So with this option, you have uh, property impacts both on Mary and on Evelyn. And those light blue colored parcels are the parcels that the city would likely need to fully acquire. The reason being that as you lower Evelyn down to 20 to 25 feet below existing, 
the ability to maintain the driveway access to those buildings, uh, the, the grade differential, the, the elevation difference is just too great. Uh, in addition, family towing and Golden West Collision Center, we'd also have impacts to them, but those are parcels that the city owns and are being leased to those businesses today, which is why they're not shown in the, in the blue color. Um, there'll be some driveway reconstructions where we can maintain access to the property. So the project would rebuild those driveways to make sure that the elevation meets up and they're still able to access those properties. Uh, the estimated construction costs for this option is between 375 and 425 million dollars. Next slide. So as part of the feasibility study, we did a traffic analysis uh, and the vehicular circulation is the same as no builds. And when I say no build, what I'm referring to is the traffic projections for 2035, which is our general plan build out year. So the, uh, the circulation, meaning the movement of the cars would, would basically remain the same as it is today with the exception of no longer having to wait at the Caltrain great gates because those will, those will no longer exist because the Caltrain uh, tracks will be above uh, the roadway. The average vehicular delays for this option would be less than the no build. And that's because we're removing that, that Caltrain crossing and, and the gates coming down and causing some delay. The one exception here to where the vehicular date delays would actually increase is for the Evelyn through movements. So folks today who are going straight on Evelyn, uh, if the train comes through at the same time, those gates come down and the only movement that is complementary that can go at the same time as the train is the Evelyn through movements. So today they get extra green time at the signal that in the future won't be needed. So that green time will get taken from that movement and, and distributed to the other movements which creates a overall improvement in delays. Uh, compared to our other option, which we're calling the jug handle, this one has uh, greater vehicular delays. The travel times for cars on Mary Avenue here are also less than no build, same reason the, the Caltrain gates are not there anymore. Uh, in the morning peak, the vehicular travel times are similar to the jug handle option, but in the afternoon commute peak, the travel times are worse. Next slide. We also took a look at the bicycle and pedestrian conflict points to uh, get an idea of comparing the two. Um, if the conflicts get, you know, quantities get worse or, or better improved. Uh, with the bi bicycle circulation, again, like vehicles, the patterns are the same, the movements you make are the same. But the uh, difference in elevation could uh, create some issues for some of the bicyclists because instead of going straight at a fairly flat intersection, you're coming down to a potentially to a stop in a downslope. And then if you're trying to make a left turn, for example, during a when when you get the green, you're you're pushing up against the elevation. But generally, the movements, the way that you make your turns, uh, are the same as they are today just a difference in elevation. We also counted up the vehicle bicycle conflict points and the figure on the left of the screen there, if you see the red arrow and those red circles with the X's in them, those are the lanes where the bicycles would have to cross to make a, a, a left turn movement. And so you can see in this option, there's, there's four potential conflict points between them. So if you add all those up together for the entire intersection, there are 14 bicycle vehicle conflict points. And that is the same as the no build because it's the same geometry, but it's two more conflict points than in the jug handle option, which has 12. The pedestrian circulation also same as no build with again, the difference in elevation. Uh, we also looked at the pedestrian vehicle conflict points. And here I'm just gonna point out the uh, the conflict between pedestrians and right turning vehicles. Again, in that figure to the left, the blue arrow is the vehicle's movement that's making that right turn. And they cross two crosswalks. So there are two circles there indicating the pedestrian vehicle conflict points. So for both 
this option and the jug handle option, it, it has eight of those pedestrian right turning vehicle conflict points. Next slide. Here are a few examples of some local, uh, relatively local underpass projects. Uh, the closer one is probably uh, Redwood City and Jefferson Avenue. It's right there near their downtown and right next to their downtown library. Also, there's one in Richmond, the other picture on the right-hand side there that shows you an underpass going under a rail, rail bridge. Next slide. The other option, <clears throat> excuse me, the other option that we're taking a look at for Mary Avenue is what we're calling the underpass with jug handle, uh, jug handle for short. And the circulation for this is different in that Mary Avenue still gets depressed to go underneath the railroad tracks, but Evelyn stays at the same elevation as existing. So Mary would go under both Evelyn and the railroad tracks. So you lose the connection between Evelyn and Mary that you have today and with the underpass option. Now, in order to continue to allow uh, all modes to make those connections between the two streets, we are proposing in this option to create what, what we're calling a jug handle. And it would operate very similar to some of the intersections we have today with Central Expressway, for example, uh, Matilda. If you are making a turn between the two, you have to drive on the small local street uh, to get between the two and you go through two smaller signals. But this is very similar to that. With this option, you no longer impact most of the private properties and businesses on Evelyn Avenue, with the uh, exception of the Valero gas station, which we could uh, would no longer have access on the Mary Avenue side, but could still have access on the Evelyn side and could potentially have access off of the jug handle. Family towing and Golden West Collision Center, again, are city owned parcels but the businesses would be impacted in this option. There are also a few driveway reconstructions, a little bit less impact to those driveway reconstructions, but we could still make those, those parcels back to uh, connections. And the cost on this option for the construction is estimated between 280 and $320 million. Next. Again, we looked at the uh, traffic impacts to this. The vehicular circulation is changed because you're, you're changing the turning movements where today you turn at one intersection, here you would have to turn through two. Uh, those who are going straight, either on Mary or Evelyn, would actually have a little bit better of a travel time and, and less delay because they're going through less uh, traffic, less, less conflicting movements for vehicles. But the two intersections that the turning movements go through are both smaller, they're T intersections. So they'd be uh, smaller delays each um, that compared to no build and the underpass option. The average vehicular delays here are less than no build and less than the underpass. And the average vehicular travel times are less than no build and less than the underpass in the afternoon uh, commute peak but it's very similar to the underpass in the morning commute peak. Next slide. Again, we took a look at the bicycle and pedestrian conflict points with vehicles. And here, uh, similar to the vehicle circulation changes, we are changing the turning movements so that you would go through two signalized intersections that are both smaller than the no build. So it's an increase in, in signals, but a decrease in the, the size and the volumes at each intersection. There are 12 vehicle, uh, I'm sorry, bicycle vehicle conflict points where again, here's the red arrow where you see uh, potential conflicts in this movement. You don't, if you're going straight, uh, you don't have any. So there's a, a, an occasion where we have a decrease. So you've got 12 with this option, whereas with the no build and the underpass, you have 14. The pedestrian circulation is also changed from the no build in that you have to travel through the jug handle uh, to make the connections between the two. And the pedestrian and right turning vehicle conflict points are the same for this, the no build and the underpass at eight total. Next slide. 
Here's a rendering uh, that is very conceptual and is not uh, engineered, <laughs> just to give an idea of what the jug handle looks like. Uh, I'd also like to say that there is a visual simulation that our consultant team put together that we showed at the community meeting. Uh, it's it's too a bit too long and, and too big to show this evening, but I encourage folks to take a look at that. It's on the city's website. If you just go on the city's website and search for Caltrain, uh, that's that page is the first item that comes up. Next slide. So here we uh, took a look at kind of the, the improvements and the metrics that we are hearing from the community are important. So on the left side in the bold, those are the items that we've heard are, are important. These are why we're doing it and, and things that, that we wanna know uh, if it gets better or worse. Uh, safety, noise, circulation of the different modes, private property impacts, construction impacts and costs. So as you can see here, I'm not going to read all the bullets, uh, but we can come back to this during Q&A if you would like. But the bold green bullets are the, the items that are an improvement between the two. And so as you can see, the underpass with jug handle has uh, reduced delays, reduced conflict points, reduced travel times, uh, less property impacts, less construction impacts less roadway construction uh, and, and construction time, which means less inconvenience to the traveling public and the local businesses and, and residences, and a lower cost overall. Next slide. So staff recommendation is for the commission to recommend to city council the underpass with jug handle option to be the proposed project to move into environmental review. Next slide. And with that, uh, I'll hand it back to Acting Chairperson Melman, and uh, I'm available for questions, comments, and discussion. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Obeso, for that uh, very interesting presentation and the uh, thoroughness of the discussion. Um, at this point, um, since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask my colleagues to use the virtual raise hand feature to indicate when they wish to speak. Um, and do I have any questions or feedback from commissioners regarding the Mary Avenue underpass? And I see that Commissioner Bonet had his hand up first and then Commissioner Wee. Chair recognizes Commissioner Bonet. Thank you, Chairman Milling, uh, Milman. Uh, thank you for the presentation. <laughs> Ms. Obeso, it was very good. Uh, excellent introduction. I have a few questions on the on the data and the concepts presented. First of all, the the justification that was that was very well received. It's important to understand why we're considering this, and the fact that safety is the is the number one is is also important. I was curious um, under the rubric of safety whether you have any particular data to or in terms of numbers, say frequency of collisions between trains and cars, trains and bicycles, trains and pedestrians and cars and the other, and uh, bicycles and pedestrians on this, on this particular intersection. And how in detail this underpass would address those. So if you don't have that now, perhaps you could make that forthcoming um, via email later. Yes, we, we do have the collision data. Um, I, I can't quote it to you exactly, so I'll definitely share it with you after. But um, from top of my head, I think that the, uh, the bulk, if not all, of the collisions with trains has been with vehicles. Um, but as far as the bicycle vehicle, pedestrian vehicle, uh, I believe that there were a few bicycle vehicle collisions within the last 10 years or so. Um, but I don't have that exact number. So, okay. and, and yeah. that was predominantly at the Evelyn Mary intersection as opposed to at the crossing itself, but they're so close that it's kind of nominal. Sure, that makes sense. If, and if you could find the numbers and distribute them uh, to us all later, that would be great. And the second one involves other numbers. I was very interested to understand how, how Caltrain developed its projections on increase of number of trains. You know, understandably they can count current train traffic, but how how accurate, how realistic do we think the Caltrain 
predictions are for a doubling or tripling or almost quadrupling of the growth and over what time frame is that? So I can I can speak to that at a very high level. I wasn't involved in in that um, those projections and that analysis. But on that slide, you see that there's there's um, baseline growth, moderate growth, and high growth. Yeah. And so what they're looking at is over the through through 2040 over the entire um, Caltrain corridor, baseline is kind of business as usual businesses pop up, more ridership pops up just from an organic perspective or, or way. And so they're projecting even if there are no major modifications or improvements to the system or the local stations, the local interactions, that they project that there's going to be by 2040, ridership's going to increase by that much. Uh, the moderate and the high growth is if there's a moderate or high uh, level of infrastructure investment. And so Projects like this, for example, would help to uh, allow more trains to come through. Their frequency could, Im could be uh, improved from their perspective, their operations, less likelihood for collisions, which cause them delays and operational issues. And so um, I think that, that you know, this is my personal perspective on reading their business plan is that they would like to see the high growth but they appreciate that that's a lot of infrastructure that needs to happen to make that happen. So uh, I, 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 my personal and professional feeling is that we'll likely see something close to the moderate uh, as far as train projections and, and they want to serve the transit riders uh, along the whole corridor. So they wanna to try to get there as well. Makes sense, all right, thank you. Um, and then two comments and questions on the various underpass options. So in general, my philosophy is one of making life as easy as possible for pedestrians and bicycles. I don't see that the underpass of Mary and Evelyn does that at all, because as you correctly pointed out, the number of conflict points is quite great. And the idea of going down into a very confined space with a concrete wall on one side and, and a high velocity vehicular traffic on the other, I think is it increases the burden or increases the, the barrier that many people will feel in wanting to risk cycling right there. So I would, I would say from that point of view that this one is actually maybe atrocious is too strong a word, but, almost, but maybe not for, for that particular option. For the, the jug handle, um, it seems like even with the jug handle there, you know, it's nice to allow cars to be able to turn from Evelyn to Mary and vice versa. But what if we got rid of that and made and focus simply on improving the safety by under by allowing an underpass? and uh, giving bikes the option of easily turning between these four streets and forget about making life easy for cars. I think, you know, again, I must emphasize, if we're going to reduce vehicular traffic and make life more pleasant for biking and, and uh, pedestrians, we've got to stop focusing as much on cars. And this jug handle, I think, does exactly that. It focuses on cars. I want to see that, I would like to see that removed and see how you can make life better for bikes and, and cars, uh, sorry, bikes and pedestrians. That's all for, for my comments, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bonet, I had muted myself. Uh, Commissioner Wee is next followed by Commissioner Beagle. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, I hope we'll have ask questions more now and then have another discussion after public comment. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Good. Okay. Um, so one just off the top question, just in general. So where is the money likely going to come to cover this construction? What are the sources? That's a great question. Um, that's something we've been thinking a lot about. And uh, with the state budgets and the federal budgets and some grant programs that are coming out of the works, uh, there are a lot that are focused on grade separations and rail safety projects like this. So we have started already trying to find funding, as much funding as we can. Uh, we don't yet know which option we're, we're moving towards, so we don't know what the end goal is, 
but we know it's a big number. <laughs> so we are working hard to track all of the um, potential funding sources that we can, state, federal, local. Uh, in addition to that, we have in Santa Clara County, the 2016 Measure B sales tax measure, which had a specific program with funding set aside for grade separations uh, and eight R2, Mountain Views 2, and the four in Palo Alto. So we have some funding secured, quite a bit of funding secured from the Measure B program that we can use to these two locations. Um, so right there, we are already in good shape to get environmental clearance fully funded uh, with the Measure B money and with local funds we already have set aside. Um, but yes, we, we are looking at every avenue we can for the construction funding. So kind of a vague answer, but we don't have a <laughs> for sure answer yet. Well, for 2016 Measure B, about how much was that that Sunnyvale would get? I thought there was some uh, guidelines already in that respect. Yes, yeah. So we've been working with VTA and the other cities very closely to figure out how to, to share that money. And as of right now, we Sunnyvale will get about uh, 120, 130 million to go to our two locations. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, let's see, through this, these intersections, uh, what are the most common um, routes that people are taking? Are they typically going straight through? Is that most of the traffic in both directions? Or um, is there any patterns? And this is both for pedestrian, separate from bicyclists, separate from motor vehicle traffic. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take one mode at a time. Uh, I think that for the vehicles, it, it's all over. There's a lot of folks making the turns between the two because Mary and Evelyn both are uh, major commute routes. And so folks going, say, up to Peary Park that maybe live downtown we might take Evelyn, turn right onto North Mary. Um, so for the vehicles, all the movements are, are there. For bicyclists, we're seeing a lot of through movements. Um, and then we also have the Evelyn Avenue multi-use trail in the works. And so that will probably increase the uh, traffic going through, bicycle and pedestrian traffic going straight through on Evelyn. And we, 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 uh, that project should be built well in advance of the beginning of construction of this. So we'll connect directly into that. Um, pedestrians, is a little bit lighter, uh, I think, because of the um, the nature of the area, uh, but also because the rail is kind of a. Um, this is my personal observation. I think it's a bit of a, a you know for pedestrians to cross a rail crossing there is is not um, enc encouraging to them. So um, I think a lot of the folks that are pedestrians mainly are walking up and down Mary on the south side. Uh, that's that's just my you know recollection of the data. Thank you, that's very helpful. And regarding the, the Evelyn project, um, so I, as I understand it, there is a possibility of having um, two-way separated uh, Evelyn or for the bike uh, bikeway along Evelyn. Um, so that actually possibly could eliminate another conflict point as well if that project happens so that traffic can go both ways on Evelyn unimpeded if um, they did the jug handle one, at least, versus the underpass, you'd, you'd have to have a conflict point going across there because they're like a pedestrian. Yes, yes. And so your conflict point was based on actually having um, the um, not two-way path on one side, but just have one in one direction and like it's just the bike lanes like you're currently on Evelyn. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. When when the study began in 2017, kind of our, our baseline of our data collection and all of that was assuming the same configuration as today. But since then, we've gotten the funding for Evelyn and we're moving that forward. Oh, and since um, we're moving that forward, is that going to go for a completely separated two way path right next to the tray? Uh, the, the, yes. Uh, yeah. It will be a separated trail for both bikes and pedestrians. It will be separated from the vehicles and it will all be on the north side. Awesome. That's very cool. Um, doesn't it eliminate then, let me think, a pedestrian conflict point also on Evelyn then possibly? We have not looked at that in detail. Um, you would, with the jug handle option, it would create the need to have crossing across Evelyn where there isn't today uh, at the jug, well, at the jug handle, you would still have an intersection there. Um, 
with the full underpass, uh, it, it would not change because would not we change already have on the crosswalks. Yeah, yeah. That's correct. yeah, that would not change. But for the jug handle one, it, yeah, for both Peds and bicyclists, it could help them. It get, could. If they're going along just Evelyn to Mountain View or to Sunnyvale. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, um, since the survey closed, do we have um, this the results of the survey? Where was the public trending? On this I have not since it just closed at midnight. I haven't had a chance to take a look. We actually got a uh, quite a good uh, showing. I, I didn't look at the numbers today, but last time I looked last week, we had almost 350 uh, survey responses. And so I will be looking at those in the weeks to come and summarizing that for the council presentation. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. That's it for my questions. Thank you, Commissioner Wee. Commissioner Beagle. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I have a lot of questions for staff, so bear with me. <laughs> um, I guess the first question is going to be kind of mundane. Why is the jug handle like 50 to $150 million cheaper than the simple underpass? It, and in conjunction with that, why does the jug handle plan supposedly not have construction impacts in Evelyn? So with the jug handle option, we are not changing the, the elevation on Evelyn at all. So we don't have to do the roadway reconstruction to bring Evelyn down. You don't have retaining walls on both sides of the road to hold back the train tracks and the, the, the businesses on Evelyn. Uh, so that in itself is a lot of structural work and structural work is usually very expensive. Uh, you have a bridge that you have to build for Evelyn so that Mary can go underneath it but that's nominal compared to all of the, the retaining walls and the digging and the earth movement you would need to do to lower Evelyn. Um, and I'm sorry, what was the second part of your question? Uh, why does the jug handle plan not have construction impacts on Evelyn? Same reason, because you're not changing the elevation on Evelyn, you are not changing the driveways or the connection points to all of those local businesses. Whereas with the full underpass option, you're lowering the entire intersection about 20 or 25 feet. And so in order to get down that low, so let's take 7-Eleven as an example. It's right on the corner of Mary and Evelyn. And so if you're standing in the, the corner of the parking lot at 7-Eleven, there's going to be a wall that drops about 20 to 25 feet. So there's not enough space on that parcel for us to be able to reconstruct a driveway to get people to be able to access the, the parcel without using, basically using the whole parcel. Okay, so, so oh, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, okay, I was gonna say, so to clarify, the, the term impact is being used to refer to impacts to the surrounding properties, not to the road itself. Or because I, I, I might've think, gotten a bit confused there. Cause like yeah. you're still gonna have to put a, like a bridge and they add an intersection for the jug handle. So there's gonna be construction on Evelyn. Yes, so. yes, there will still be construction, but it'll be much less, it'll be a shorter duration, it'll have less impacts to the traveling public, the properties, okay. the access to the properties. Yes, so yeah, you're correct. Okay, uh, that answers my question there. Uh, let me figure out my next question. Um, so why is there a crosswalk on the eastern side of the jug handle connection to Evelyn, but not on the western side? It seems like the plan is just trying to fudge the numbers on conflict points by making pedestrian lives a bit more difficult? So what we did was we assumed, so, so with the jug handle option, both intersections will essentially be T intersections. And typically uh, for operations, you would try to have only one crosswalk because if you're, if you're walking, so if we're looking at Evelyn and the jug handle, for example, if you're walking along the north side of Evelyn, Either crosswalk will get you where you want to go roughly. And so typically we look at, at um, trying to minimize so that the overall cycle time of the signal is lower. If you, have, if you have two crosswalks, then your cycle time gets greater for everybody. And so it was just an assumption. It wasn't any look at you know, trying to reduce uh, conflict points. We did look at both and we tried to uh, have the most conservative estimate. Okay. But I'll, in I'll... final design, to address, I think, your concern, in final design, we will evaluate what is the appropriate side to put a crosswalk, or do we put crosswalks on both sides? So just because it's shown that way in this conceptual drawing doesn't mean that that's how it will be built in the future. We'll take a look at it in more detail 
and it'll get designed to what needs to to you know what the what the projections and the need and the safety should be. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, I'll defer to Commissioner Bonet. Actually, you will not question. defer to Commissioner oh. Bonet because I have not yet spoken. So oh, okay, cool. Because I'm not supposed to ask a question before everybody else asks. Yeah. So, so have so. you finished your comments, Commissioner? Be uh, questions, Commissioner Beagle. Well, I have more questions, but I don't want to just. No, keep if you okay. have questions, okay. keep asking them. If All right, you have a comment, I'll... we could save those for the end. So. All right. What then I'll keep asking question? questions. <laughs> um, then uh, did the study look into closing the conflict point at Bidwell or so there's a new conflict point at Bidwell Avenue uh with the turn lane that's well it's not a new conflict point but there's going to be a very busy conflict point at Bidwell Avenue with the intersection as well as the new turn lane that's serving double duty traffic for both left and right onto Evelyn mm -hmm. uh, that's going to create a very dangerous situation for pedestrian bicyclists so did the study look into maybe just closing Bidwell Avenue's connection to Mary entirely because the uh the it doesn't actually inconvenience drivers that much because it's very easy for drivers to just go one street south back to, uh, it is Carson Drive. So in essence, we're turning that, that little street into a cul-de-sac for like 20 houses in total at, with by creating, if we make it only open to pedestrians and bicyclists and remove this major conflict point. Did the study investigate doing that? The study did not look at changing any of the streets except for the ones shown in the exhibits that we just looked at, but I've taken a note and that's certainly something that we can look at moving forward. Okay. Um, then next question. Uh, uh, what is preventing the westbound traffic on uh, uh, Evelyn on the jug handle plan from just continuing uninterrupted without having to stop at the stoplight? Because there's no conflict point for the uh, the sorry, the bicycle traffic, I should say. Uh, there's no conflict point if you're going westbound. Uh, or for bicycles um, at the jug handle on Evelyn. So westbound bicycles. The the need for the signal is because you've got turning movements. Folks going westbound to southbound need to make that left turn, and so they need a protected phase. Um, also, if we have pedestrians crossing Evelyn, uh, any through movements will need to be controlled so that the, the, um, they can get through. Um, but with the Evelyn multi-use trail, uh, I, I can't say this with certainty, but I can, I can suspect that the trail being physically separate from the roadway, we could potentially make the trail not controlled unless you're moving across Evelyn. So once the trail's in place, then yes, I think you're right. The, the bikes and the pedestrians could continue both east and westbound uh, uncontrolled. Okay. Um, and then, so I, I know there's this uh, discussion of the trail on Evelyn, but was there any thought put into, or like just study or investigation put into upgrading the classification of the bike lanes on Mary itself? Because it's just maintaining class two bike lanes at when we're just spending Three hundred million dollars to widen the road to to redo these roads. Surely we could upgrade the bike lane classification to a class four bike lane. It, and like even if we don't do the classification change, leave the space for a future upgrade when the city decides that it wants to do that on all of Mary. Uh, was that investigated? So what we included in these conceptual designs is what is in our ATP. And so that's the minimum that we would we would do, and that's kind of the, the what we what we assumed as part of this study. Uh, but with that said, this is something that will get looked at. We we've, we've heard loud and clear from the community that separated bike lanes, uh, class two buffered, separated paths are generally preferred. And so when we get into final design, we will look at. We'll we'll have a refined set of data that we can look at. How much space do we really have? can we put in separated bikeways or not? So this, th what we're meeting with this conceptual is meets the ATP. Okay. Um, and then one last question. Uh, is it standard practice? Like, is there a requirement that the turn lanes need to sit to the right of the bike lanes? Uh, like the Dutch bicycle, or the Dutch intersection design, for instance, always has the bike lanes to the right of traffic turning or not. Well, why do we have the conflict point by having the two lane switch and then switch back instead of just keeping the bicyclists always to the right of the turn lane? 
Yeah, that that is a, a standard practice in California. I, I believe that's something in our in our California Manual of Uniform Traffic Control Devices, the MUTCD, uh, and so that's our standard design. Uh, but it's certainly something that you know we can look into, and, and we we in the city staff try to keep abreast of what other folks are doing and, and what standard practice uh, best practices are. So by the time we get to final design, we will, you know, consider other options that we could do. Okay, got it. Okay, I think that's all my questions. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Beagle. Sorry, Commissioner Bonet, you're gonna have to wait until my questions <laughs> since you've already had a chance to speak. Uh, Commissioner Beagle, if you could lower your hand, please, if you're done with your questions. Um, my first question is, is that um, I just wanna clarify. So the um, proposed, um, level of bike lanes uh, are just class two bike lanes in this conceptual design? Yes. Okay. And that is the floor of the ATP bike lane design, correct? It's not the ceiling, it's the floor. Correct. Okay. Um, all right. And then the other question I have is, um, why has the conceptual design not incorporated two stage uh, bike turn queues? to reduce the number of conflict points in the signalized intersections. Because my concern is, is um, in accessing the jug handle, again, you're crossing traffic. Um, if there was a two stage turn, it would, you know, uh, it would be easier. And then again, at the T intersections um, in the jug handle concept, again, having a two stage uh, turn queue would again, reduce the number of conflict points for cyclists when they're making lefts, rather than anticipating that they would either move into a left turn lane with vehicular traffic. That is um, what we looked at in the conceptual was a standard intersection, uh, but we can certainly look at that. Uh, that's something that I've heard from other folks that would be um, desirable. And so in, in final design, we could refine this conceptual design to see how that would impact and if we could fit that in. Okay, I think going forward in conceptual design, I would uh, like to see, rather than building to the floor of the ATP, that it builds to the highest standards of the ATP, and that um, we, we incorporate uh, NACTO standards in terms of intersections to increase the safety for cyclists and pedestrians in the intersections, rather than assuming that it will be business as usual and the we design intersections which still favor vehicular traffic over any other forms of transportation. Um, that, that can't be going forward. Um, and then the other, uh, so I noticed that in the conceptual design, it looks like the, um, uh, the jug handle, it looks like the, um, uh, gas station disappears because it looks like there's a crosswalk going through the, yeah. the ad here or something yeah. like that. So um, if there is an acquisition of the property where the Valero station currently is or, and the other properties, um, what other uses can that property be put to besides the, the jug handle? For instance, I know this is a residential area and that they're aside from Washington Park, there isn't a park close by. So could there be like you know, a potential park installation there as a possibility. That, that is something that we've heard uh, before. Um, the one concern about putting a park at this location would be the, the fast and high volumes of traffic commuting, uh, but it is definitely a good open space area. Uh -huh. um, it would, it, if, if we did uh, end up acquiring that gas station, which we don't know if we will at this time, Right, um, I understand if, this is a conceptual design, yeah. yes. But, but if we do, that there's a number of, of ideas that we've heard through the public outreach and the stakeholder outreach, a, a, a park or parklet, um, a nice, uh, you know, trees, some good landscaping to increase, you know, fresh air in the neighborhood. Um, also having uh, some place for drainage, uh, if we ever get rain again. <laughs> Although we got a little today, but, um, you know, good drainage, a place where we could store water uh, that mm -hmm. runs off from the roadways to help us with some of our green infrastructure needs throughout the city. Um, so we've got a list of, of options, but a, a Parker Parklet is a potential option that we would look at in the final design phase. Okay, and in the left turn onto the jug handle from um, Evelyn into the jug handle, um, 
I'm assuming that would be a signalized intersection. We would be moving the signalized intersection down from Mary since that will no longer exist technically. And then that becomes the new signalized intersection. Correct. Okay. And, um, <clears throat> okay. So, um, yeah, so, so those are my two basic questions is that <clears throat> in these conceptual con uh, concepts um, that uh, we should be building to the higher standards in the, con in the proposed designs, not to the lowest standard. Because if we always have built to the lowest standard, then we're not going to actually um, uh, improve our infrastructure. We're just building, uh, we're just uh, maintaining the status quo um, as it is. So um, that would be my comment. So now we will open, uh, before we, uh, we will do the commissioner comments and then we will get to the, the public comments. So. Um, uh, Commissioner Bonet, you were first, and then Commissioner Wee. Thank you, Chair Mailman. So uh, I guess I would like to follow up on two of the, the questions already raised, and in particular, the separation of bicycle and, and pedestrian versus vehicle traffic, on, particularly on Mary, as it goes under the Caltrain. So it appears that the, the current study is at the minimum level proposed in the trans, um, Sunnyvale Transportation Plan. What, what would be the budget and the space impact if, for example, there is a concrete barrier separating the bicycles from the vehicles? Um, we, we did not look at that in detail. I, I could speculate, you know, for a concrete barrier, you need a couple feet for the barrier itself another couple feet for a little bit of wiggle room on either side, uh, comfort zone for the bicyclists, uh, your handlebars not hitting the barrier, all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So um, the bike lane itself would remain the same as what we're proposing here, a standard six feet. Um, and so it would probably add four, five, six feet on both sides. Um, but I can't tell you off the top of my head, I don't have the information in front of me, how much right of way we actually have there. And if we could work with the lane widths, if we could gain some room there, um, I, I, I don't know that, uh, I don't have that cross section with me, but it's certainly something that I hear and I'm taking uh, fast and furious notes <laughs> to make sure I capture this. So as we move into design, those things are looked at. Okay. And on, on the uh, <clears throat> taking space from vehicle lanes questions, what is the minimum vehicle lane width that could be implemented here? Here we would probably stick to a minimum of 11 because there are uh, delivery trucks that come through here. Uh, for example, the gas station, uh, they have their big rigs that the tanker trucks that come through. And so those those types of vehicles traveling on, along Mary and Evelyn need uh, more room that all the car uh, repair shops, they probably have large delivery trucks that come in there too as well. So uh, mm. short answer, probably 11 feet. Vehicle. But that would be 11 for both lanes? Is it possible to have one vehicle lane narrower than the other? That's a good question. I don't know. That, that's a good question, though. But, uh, you can probably see what I'm getting at. I'm trying to maximize the space for bicycles while absolutely minimizing that for, for vehicles. So I would, I would like to, to ask um, whether you can consider that. And then sure. the second question... You know, I mentioned there's been a lot of discussion about the uh, the jug handle option. Did you consider breaking the vehicle connection between Evelyn and Mary and eliminating the jug? Uh, while we, still allowing bicycles and pedestrians to go between these two roads. We did not. We did not look at breaking the vehicle connection in our analyses. Mm. I Is believe Commissioner Beagle had asked that similar question. Mm. Okay. I guess I, I, I didn't hear it explicitly, so yeah. I yeah, I, I think that the reason, if, if just to go a little deeper, if, if I may, <laughs> I think sure. the reason that we didn't, uh, it didn't occur to include that in our analysis was because Mary is, uh, Mary and Evelyn both are, are very high commute traffic, uh, vehicle traffic and, and bicycle traffic routes. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, that would, just looking at the vehicle numbers that we collected, the existing counts, uh, it, it seemed like an option that wasn't uh, 
a, a good option to to explore. Uh, but I, full disclosure, I was not here as I wasn't part of the team at the time, and so I'm just speculating what what may have occurred. Mm. Um, but so, so you have uh, vehicle counts of vehicles traveling, say, east west on Evelyn, north south on Mary, but do you have counts specifically for turning from Mary to Evelyn and vice versa? Yes. Yes, the traffic memo, uh, which was included as an attachment to the RTC for the July 21st BPAC meeting, uh, there are appendices there that include all of the counts with all of the various movements and the projections of what those counts would be in the future. Mm, okay. So we do have that data. Oh, good. Thank you. I'll go back and look at that. Thank you. That's all my questions. Thank you, Commissioner Bonet. Um, Commissioner Wee. Yeah, one last question. Um, how many more times will this project come in front of BPAC before implementation? Uh, it, I don't believe that we have any other action points for BPAC. Uh, we, we may during environmental clearance. Uh, I don't know. We haven't, we haven't scoped the environmental clearance portion yet. But as far as the feasibility study, this is the, we're at the home stretch here. And so we are looking for your recommendations and then we're taking it to council and then we're, we're wrapping up the feasibility study. Uh, so for the feasibility study, you will not see it again. You may see it during environmental. Yeah, I'm before. considering proposing a friendly amendment to the approval of the feasibility study, Commissioner Wade, just so you know. So, um, but I wanted to hear from public comment first. Okay, uh, that's it for the question, thank you. All right, um, now, uh, since we've uh, had the uh, commissioners have their comments and questions, we will open uh, for public comment. And since we remain in a virtual setting, I will ask the public to use the virtual raise hand feature or dial star nine on a telephone to indicate they wish to speak. City staff will ask you to unmute your microphone when it is your turn to address the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. At this time, please limit your comments to the Mary Avenue under crossing portion of this uh, meeting only, um, as that is all that is on the agenda. And um, a second, uh, you know, um, and, and you know, that is all we're discussing at this point in time. So we're not going to discuss any other crossings or, or so forth. So uh, moving to the public, it seems we have two hands raised. Um, first will be Ari Feinsmith, um, and then followed by Dan Haifman. Okay, so Ari, I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to talk. Please unmute yourself. And you have 30 minutes, I said, you have three minutes. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> Don't give them thirty. <laughs> um, okay, and then um, I will go ahead and share the um, PowerPoint that you sent to us um, prior to the meeting. Give me one second. Okay. You may, you may start. All right, thanks. Um, uh, hi, my name is Ari Feinsmith. I'm the team leader of Bike Sunnyvale, the local chapter of the Silicon Valley Bicycle Coalition. First, I wanna thank Angelo Besso for a, another amazing presentation and for meeting with us uh, beforehand to talk, talk about these projects and help us have a better understanding of it. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? So in our opinion, we don't really see either of these intersection designs standing out as um, significantly more bike or pedestrian friendly than the other one. Um, we did a analysis, we appreciate the analysis of the conflict points. Um, and if you assume that there are going to be two crosswalks on both Mary and then there are two on Evelyn, then the number of conflict points is about the same uh, for bicycle and pedestrians on both designs. Um, the question becomes, what will the details look like? And I understand this is at a conceptual uh, stage right now. So it's kind of hard to know, which makes the decision of which option to choose difficult as well. Um, I think the um, one of the ways that these uh, designs could be enhanced is by making them protected intersections, for example. Um, if you go to the next slide, I'll have a couple of examples of uh, things we've discussed um, that in the team, uh, the Bike Sunnyvale team, one of which is a protected intersection which would reduce, make it easier for left turns 
So it reduces the number of conflict points for cyclists from 12 to zero. Um, next slide. Um, for uh, the jug handle option, we have two suggestions. One is to make uh, both intersections protected. Um, I found a design that was done in Portland with a T intersection that is protected. Um, this would really help uh, reduce the bicycle, the bicycle conflict points um, from 14 to two um, and similar uh, effects with pedestrians, I believe. Um, and then with uh, the even better option would be to have bicycle and pedestrian ramps on um, Evelyn that go down to Mary. So bicyclists and pedestrians would could just use the trail and these ramps to get from between the two streets and therefore would not um, need to interact with any intersections at all. Um, so next slide, please. Um, we've kind of rated each of these um, alternatives where red is the worst and dark green is the best. Second left. Okay, thank you. Um, ultimately, as you can tell with the basic design, which is kind of like the conceptual design that we have right now, assuming nothing changes from that, um, you see a good amount of red and yellow and, or and orange. Um, but depending on what enhancements are added, you get much better, um, it, 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 you know, uh, the options look much better. Uh, so like if, if one of these options was could be enhanced with a protecting intersection and another could not, it would make the decision a lot easier. Um, time is up. All right, all done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Finesmith. Um, um, Mr. Haifman, you wish to speak. Um, Mr. Haysman, I'm going to go ahead and allow you to talk. Please unmute yourself. Please go ahead. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to mention of the two choices, I certainly favor the jug handle. It's a lot less expensive. And as many people have commented, it seems like the bicycle pedestrian situation between the two choices, if anything, is maybe roughly the same or slightly better for the jug handle. There was a comment about eliminating the jug handle, handle altogether. I will tell you, as a person who lives in the neighborhood, what will happen? Traffic wanting to get between those streets will from Carson and sunset, right through residential neighborhoods. Because it won't stop people from wanting to make those turns. They'll just go through the residential neighborhoods to do it rather than doing it with the jug handle. So that's something to consider. Uh, I have a question for staff in the BPAC packet. At last Thursday's meeting, there were options of the jug handle that involved, the second option involved two auto ramps for making the, on, on the train track side of the roadway, making it easy to get southbound uh, Mary to, to westbound Evelyn and the other side too. Like if that option were to be implemented, that would wipe out the ability to have the um, Evelyn bikeway simply because there's not enough room for an auto ramp and the bikeway. Uh, so I'm I notice that's not in the packet today. So I'm hoping that option has been dropped because that's not a good idea. Um, one other thing I don't like about the submerged intersection is the 7-Eleven has to go away. And the meetings that happened in 2017, the public was irate when they heard they were gonna close 7-Eleven. It's a highly used local store. People can walk to it. And so from a climate point of view, the last thing is close that store and people start getting in their cars if they have to go get a bottle of ketchup or something. Um, and uh, I think that's pretty much my comments. Oh, one thing, the do nothing option. Uh, I've heard that mentioned a couple of times. It isn't just for convenience of cars. It's for the reliability of the you have 30 seconds left. Cal Caltrain system itself. Whenever there's an at-grade crossing, people can get on the tracks. And unfortunately, we have a lot of suicides that happen by Caltrain, disrupts the system for two to three hours every time it happens. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Haveman. Are there any other members of the public uh, wishing to speak? Mr. Feinsmith, your hand is still raised. Could you please lower it? Okay, seeing no other members of the public uh, wishing to speak uh, at this point, um, we'll, <laughs> excuse me, we'll uh, have a motion. Uh, oh, Mr. Commissioner Wee, did you wish to say something? Um, I was wondering if we could just have a little bit of discussion before we went to the motion first. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Um, and actually, let's see. I would like to see this project come back to the commission before the it, it, sometime during the final design phase, so we have some influence on how some choices are made um, that are more detailed that we haven't had seen presented yet. Um, so, sometime during that time, I'd like to have like one more chance for the BPAC to give input on choices made. Um, I'm trending right now toward the jug handle option because it reduces the conflict points and having a, a nice clean pathway on Evelyn is extremely attractive because we're going between downtown Mountain View and downtown Sunnyvale, it'd be nice to have just a very nice, easy route. And this the jug handle makes that very nice versus the um, depression piece. And I'm also trending that direction uh, with the staff recommendation because it's just lower impact all around, lower costs, lower construction costs, fewer environmental impacts. Um, that's that's where I am currently trending, unless I hear otherwise from my other commissioners, something compelling heading in another direction. So that's it for my comments right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Murray. Commissioner Beagle? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, spend a couple seconds to clarify the comments that I had based on like closing a connection, because I think there's some sure. confusion. Uh, I'm gonna share my screen briefly if that's okay. Uh, where is the selection? There we go. Um, okay, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I was talking about the Bidwell Avenue connection here, not the connection between the uh, Mary and Evelyn it entirely. Ah. I, I think that should be closed to uh, vehicle traffic, um, and, but open to bike and ped using, get out of my way, there we go. Uh, using like just barricades, like a, a very common in European cities. Um, I don't know if you can you can still see my screen right with the pictures mm -hmm. okay um and then to clarify about my comments about just it's not being that inconvenient so if we cut off the connection can you see the map now yes mm -hmm. okay if we cut off the connection to Bidwell avenue to vehicles it's not a very hard route for them to come around to carson and then continue to marry um, so I, I think it's a win for pedestrians and bicyclists at a very minor cost to cars and people like cul-de-sacs anyways. So like it's off to the selling point for a house and that kind of turns this into a cul-de-sac except for bikes and beds, which doesn't really have any downsides. Uh, okay, that's my comment there. So I'll stop sharing. Thank you, uh, Commissioner Beagle. Um, uh, it, it, what I also wanted to have my comments that I am leaning also towards the jug handle, but uh, what I would like to propose is that um, if whatever amendment, uh, whatever we approve in terms of that, we amend our approval to state that we wish uh, the final, since this is just a draft proposal, um, and, and so um, that we, as the BPAC, would like to see the final proposal, obviously, and prove it before it comes before the city council, and that um, the, uh, the standards for the, uh, for the final proposal uh, for the ATP be brought up to more than the minimum standards in terms of bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. And that would be my, um, I guess, uh, amendment or comment, friendly, friendly comment or amendment to the uh, to any approval that we give. Although it seems that we are all leaning towards the uh, jug handle, I'm assuming. Uh, Commissioner Wee. So um, if we're ready for a motion, I'd like to make a motion that we endorse alternative to the recommended staff recommendation for the jug handle at Mary Ave. Mm -hmm. And the stipulation that we'd also like to see this come back to the BPAC um, sometime during the, when it's appropriate during the final designs, we have a input on that before it gets locked down. Um, Commissioner Beagle? Uh, would now be the time for a friendly amendment or after a second? After a second. Uh, after okay. a second, yes. Got it. Okay. Uh, then I would second Commissioner Wee's uh, proposal 
since uh, nobody else seems very quick on the uh, on the hand raising. Um, and and I feel that um, just seeing the draft proposal um, with respect to uh, a design does not in, uh, uh, constitute BPAC endorsement of the actual uh, uh, of the actual infrastructure. It is just saying that we agree with the proposed design changes, but um, as the BPAC, I agree with Commissioner Wee is that we would like to see the final proposal and have a voice in that because that's what counts. Uh, Commissioner Beagle. Sorry, I meant to lower my hand because you're, you're seconding oh. right now, right? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. So, um, so uh, with respect, um, I'm blanking here just for a second here. So I think we have to approve, have a vote, initial vote on the uh, amend, friendly amendment. <laughs> Commissioner Wee? Um, let's see. Well, first, we each of us will speak to our motion and then yes, we'll take Yes, yes. Commissioner Wee, do you wish to speak to your motion first? Yes. Um, so, yes, I do uh, like this jug handle option because it basically minimizes the impacts to the area, minimizes construction and climate change. And it is much... I believe there's more favorable options for bicycle and pedestrian movement through this intersection than there would be for a fully depressed intersection. Mm -hmm. so, and we also need to, you know, just make sure that the fine tuning before the final design that is useful to have feedback so we get possibly protected intersections for bicycles and pedestrians at those locations, as well as some other uh, enhancements. Thank you. Yeah. And with regards to my second, I think I've already stated why I would second in, in that respect, that I believe that any final proposals must be before the BPAC. Um, if there are any major other amendments to our friendly amendments, it would be a formal motion to amend that the next commissioner would have to do, and then that we would have to do a, um, sorry, we would have to have a second and so forth before we collate all these amendments to uh, our final vote. So, Commissioner Beagle. So, I just for clarification, I'm still trying to learn the process here. You both okay. did. You both uh, stated motions, and now we're moving to second. The so, Commissioner, we proposed, and I seconded, and okay. and now we are debating the friendly amendment. So, are there any further debates on the current friendly amendment, Commissioner Bonet? Thank you, Chair Millman. So, my question, uh, Commissioner Owe, is. Does your amendment as proposed limit consideration to recommending only the, the jug handle option? Or would you consider a proposal of um, depressing Mary and eliminating the connection to Mary and Evelyn by omitting the jug handle? I think he formally proposed the jug handle option. Therefore, we cannot consider the Mary depression. If you wish to vote against his proposed option and then um, propose your own to the other alternative, you can certainly do so, but only after we vote on this motion. Okay. May I make a comment actually about that little discussion point? Um, I think having vehicular traffic connecting between Mary and Evelyn, that's just such a heavily used intersection. And it would force traffic onto some other streets that would have an adverse impact. And it's the best to handle that I'm at a, an intersection designed for them than to force them onto some streets that aren't designed well for them. So that, that's my thinking on that. I would agree in that respect. Other than uh, Central Expressway and El Camino, which are the two other major connections to those roads, um, and Washington, um, those are all residential streets and, um, and with uh, low traffic volumes. And it would not be pleasant for the residents of those streets, like, uh, for instance, Bernardo would have an increased traffic flow uh, to bypass it. Um, yeah, I think Washington and Sunset that. then would. Yeah, and then right. Washington. And, uh, yes, exactly. Very good point. Thank you. OK, Commissioner Beagle. <laughs> so I, did you so, wish to make a formal motion to amend <laughs> the friendly amendment? as it now stands. So the, just to clarify, the amendment is what you have proposed for the ATP stuff? Or? It is not what I have proposed. Oh. Right now, well. the amendment is what Commissioner Wee has proposed. Oh, we're amending the yes. thing in the actual report. Right, so Commissioner okay. Wee, would you wish to restate your formal, uh, yeah. your <laughs> proposed 
Well, so I, we have a motion. We have a motion to. And that, yeah, so I, have, I don't have a friendly amendment myself, but okay. Commissioner Beagle would like to propose a friendly amendment to my motion. Okay, there then we go. Then we can accept that without okay. having to go to a vote yet okay. uh, on the amendment. So, yeah. so I would like to propose a friendly amendment to your motion in that uh, the final design standards be brought before the BPAC for approvals before a city council vote and that the formal design standard, the final design standards meet more than the minimum ATP standards for bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure. Um, okay, so the first part, I'd actually had included that in my motion that it come back. But the second part I hadn't included <laughs> um, as far as raising the standard. Right. And I'll, I'll accept that, that's fine. Okay, thank you for accepting that. And my reasons are is that I believe that any design proposal that is brought before us should be more than the minimum of the active transportation plan standards because what we are trying to do is we are trying to build infrastructure which um, is makes bicycling and pedestrian um, um, uh, methods of transit safer um, and having class two bike lanes. If I hear another class two bike lane approval I will scream because we should be having higher class bike lanes. And if we're always meeting the minimum, we will never get to the um, requirements. We're the only major city in Silicon Valley, which does not have any miles of higher level bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, higher class bicycle pedestrian infrastructure in it uh, for various reasons. So that is the reason why I am proposing uh, this friendly amendment to uh, to Commissioner Weiss so that the uh, final design standards are more than the minimum of the active transportation plan. Commissioner Beagle, I mean, do I hear a second for that? Yeah, I, I will second uh, that. Commissioner, we accepted, so you second, okay, thank you. <laughs> I can't second my own motion. <laughs> okay. Um, does anyone have any other debate regarding the proposed Commissioner Wee, you're fast with that. <laughs> um, were there any other friendly amendments being asked right That's now? That's what I was asking. If there's any any further amendments or discussion regarding the current Commissioner Beagle. Uh, okay, I have a friendly amendment to uh, change the proposal to recommend that council modify the plan to uh, close the Bidwell Avenue intersection with married to vehicular traffic while keeping it open to pedestrians and bicycles, thereby removing a dangerous conflict point. Do we have a second to Commissioner Beagle's motion? Well, I'll second, but I was going to accept that as a friendly amendment. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> we don't have to do a formal. Um, That's amendment. true. That's true. That's I true. Say, You're yeah. accepting his second. Uh, his, okay. I'm accepting his friendly amendment. Now you'll have to as a seconder. Okay. Um, I would actually reject that friendly amendment. And my reasons are this. Um, for... Um, Safety vehicle access. I believe that Bidwell Avenue should remain open because what you're doing is diverting um, fire and ambulance uh, through a longer route. Secondly, you're also diverting more traffic through a residential neighborhood. I kind of agree that would be nice to have, um, you know, Bidwell Avenue closed and have it, um, uh, you know, be the case. Commissioner Beagle, you'll get to speak in a second. <laughs> Um, but uh, the reason why I'm rejecting is because I believe that um, the impacts to the residents of the neighborhood with increased vehicular traffic would be detrimental, as well as the possible safety impacts for fire and um, trans, uh, uh, emergency vehicle access. Commissioner Wee, since you were the owner of the motion, I'll have you speak first. Um, so what I would say is that we don't actually at this point, recommend it absolutely happen, but that it be looked at and evaluated um, as where I think we should go. And that's actually when the final plan comes back, then we could actually see whether it worked out or not. I would like this investigated because I think it is a very attractive option. And I don't see that um, fire access would be, but I don't know, it needs to be looked at. And, and we need a staff report on it, basically, to see what would the effect of closing Bidwell be 
and I'd like to, I would like it looked at. I think it's a good consideration. So as the owner of the motion, are you asking Commissioner Beagle if he wishes to amend his friendly amendment? <laughs> or to modify his friendly amendment. Modify his friendly amendment, <laughs> Commissioner it, Beagle. I will accept that friendly amendment amendment. No, or, can you please no. restate to modify the, mod the modification? Okay, I will modify. Amendment. Okay, I will restate it. Uh, yeah. So uh, to investigate, so I want the plan, the council uh, to change the recommendation to the council that they modify the plan to investigate closing the Bedwell Avenue intersection with Mary to vehicular traffic while keeping it open to pedestrians and bicycles, thereby removing a dangerous conflict point. Commissioner Wee, do you accept this uh, additional addition to your friendly, uh, yes. to your motion? Yes. And then I will accept as the second. Okay. So what we are voting on to restate is we are voting on the recommendation that we approve option uh, the staff option, the staff recommendation to for the Mary Avenue underpass um, with the jug handle, with the understanding that the um, recommendation that the final plan design uh, be presented to the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission um, before a city council votes on the final plan design, and that the final plan design includes uh, higher elements of the active transportation plan than, than, the, uh, than is currently provided, and that the, um, <laughs> that the uh, uh, further study be conducted as to proposing the closure of, um, I'm sorry, Bidwell Avenue, the impacts of a, of a closure to Bidwell Avenue to vehicular traffic as part of our endorsement of the proposed staff recommendation. I think that summarized it adequately. Mr. Lay, does that make sense? Yes, that makes okay. sense. Okay, thank so you. We, I, I'm, we... I'm trying to make sure we get it all down. <laughs> so therefore, uh, Commissioner Beagle. <laughs> so I don't wanna be a paid, but I do have another friendly amendment. Uh, uh, regarding, so I want to also modify the plan to investigate, have the council investigate adding a connecting bike ramp from Evelyn onto Mary, bypassing the jug candle, as we saw during public comment. Uh, Commissioner Wee, what are your thoughts on that? I thought we had closed amendments at this point, but uh, I will permit this one time, Commissioner Beagle, because you're new, but next time when we finish. Closing debate, we close debate. Well, I, I didn't hear that debate was exactly well, closed. I you mean, just restated the motion. The, the, right, so that we can vote on it. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, Commissioner Wee, <laughs> your thoughts on adi this addition to your amendment, to your motion? Sorry. Um, I'm going to have a question for staff. Um, I thought I saw at one point that that was actually considered having a direct connection there. So, so what was considered was a direct vehicular ramp uh, to make those two left turn movements, westbound Evelyn to northbound Mary and southbound Mary to westbound, no, I'm sorry, yeah, westbound <laughs> Evelyn, uh, the train track side. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, Mr. Haifman had referred to that option. That yeah. is something that we staff presented to city council in a study session in April. And once we dug a little deeper, did a little analysis, we found that the benefits uh, were, were minimal, but the impacts, especially to the uh, private properties on the south side of Evelyn, because in order to make that ramp, the width that you need, you have to shift that, you have to shift Evelyn south. Mm -hmm. And so suddenly the benefit of not impacting all of those properties, all of those businesses on the south side was uh, that benefit was gone because we'd have to shift it over so much. Uh, we did not look at that specifically for bicycles, but we did think about it and tried to speculate whether the impacts would be the same. Uh, they would be roughly the same. You would need a little less width, but in order to shift the road down to make room for a bike ramp, and then taper back, you actually, for roadway and for vehicle, I'm, I'm sorry, for, for bicycles and for vehicles, you, you because you have to taper back, uh, you end, end up impacting quite a few properties. 
So short answer is we did not look at bicycles in particular, but we determined not to move forward with the vehicular ramp option because the impacts were greater than the benefits. It My question to the commission would be, um, are we able to propose a friendly amendments on infrastructure which does not yet exist? So we do not yet have an Evelyn Trail, okay? Um, so so it's, it's until it's physically there, we're proposing studying something which does not exist. And so um, I don't know if you can make a study on that since we actually have not um, developed that actual infrastructure. So I, I have some comments regarding that. Um, I, I think it's fine for us to consider it, but I also I don't wanna make a motion too complex. Um, and also in my own experience with that kind of design, there is that kind of design currently in Palo Alto at University Ave. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's, a, it's really awkward at that intersection at the bottom of it, trying to navigate it. It's just for bikes. Um, so it's not a particularly, it's not a very fat, <laughs> you got to come to it's kind of a stop and you have very poor lines of sight. I'm not a particularly good, a big fan of that particular kind of design um, into a bikeway, unless you've got a lot, lot more space to work with. And right now, I know that is a very tight corridor just to get the um, two-way bike path in there. And for the reason that staff uh, um, expressed that I'm not interested in actually that as a friendly amendment at this time. So Commissioner Beagle, your proposed friendly amendment has been rejection, rejected by the motion holder. Do you have anything further to say? Um, I don't know the formal process for doing this, but the same exact thing with, for just a pedestrian ramp. Uh, Commissioner Wade. <laughs> um, I think we could actually consider that actually the final design um, with staff, so we could, staff have heard the comments, and when they um, do their final design, they, they could actually say, "Oh, hey, you know, that's not such a bad idea." But as far as our fine, our, our motion, I'm still wanting to keep it. As, it's already gotten a little bit complex. Leave it <laughs> as is, and the staff can, you know, have that in the back of their minds and think about does the pedestrian piece work for that? Then it might be a stairway, though, rather than and then the bicycles would be tempted to like zoom down it, and that actually would be much more compact. Um, so uh, it's the possibility, but. Again, leaving it off the uh, the amendment or the uh, the motion at this time. Yeah. Simply. Again, this is a draft proposal, um, and we're just right making the recommendation on the draft proposal, um, and that when the when the final design um, comes through, when we will have more um, idea of what the actual physical infrastructure will look like, then might it might be more appropriate to. Um, to make your suggestions then, or that we could, uh, you know, in terms of their funding for the project, um, get additional funding for uh, connections to whatever infrastructure is built for bicycles and pedestrian on the Evelyn proposed Evelyn Avenue uh, trail, which does not yet exist. <laughs> does that make sense, Commissioner Beagle? Yep, makes sense. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so again, um, if, if we have no further motions to the, uh, uh, no further amendments to the motion, okay, um, and so um, we will proceed with the motion as I previously stated, uh, Mr. Tay, so if we could have the formal vote. Sounds good. Um, Commissioner Owe? Yes. Vice Chair Mellon? Yes. Commissioner Bonet? Yes. Commissioner Dave is absent today. Commissioner Beagle? Yes. And Commissioner Haveman and Chair Manager uh, discussed, um, discussed themselves today. Refused, so, yes. Yeah, so um, the motion will, su uh, will succeed, uh, carry with four yes and one absent, and then three, I'm um, sorry, two excuse. Okay. All right. Um, sorry, I have a cat on the hand. <laughs> um, let me go back to my script. And let me go back to the agenda. <laughs> so I've kind of lost my place after all that. All right. Um, so we have 
I wish to thank the commissioner and I, I wish to thank city staff and Ms. Obeso, um, especially for her presentation again on behalf of the commission um, for this very complex um, and intriguing uh, infrastructure change. Uh, we will look forward to seeing what occurs in the future. Um, and uh, thanking again the members of the public who spoke on uh, behalf of their interests in this. And um, we'll, um, I guess we will see what the future brings. And uh, I believe that is the it for this meeting. So I formally adjourn this special meeting of the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Commission. I don't have anything to bang like Richard. <laughs> Good night. Thank you guys for, yes, for dealing with my yeah. back and forth and mangling. I'm sure Richard would have been more <laughs> succinct in his things, but you did very well. Okay. Thank you for putting up with all my uh, my comments. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> it's, a, it's a learning curve. I, I, I did the same thing when I started out. It's just that, you know, uh, when, when you, 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 we, there's a lot of stuff that we want but we can't ask for it right now. And so when you're looking at a draft proposal like this, um, you know, keep in mind um, of, of what is reasonable to expect from the city for the project. And then, you know, we'll get there. It's slow, but we'll get there. <laughs> uh, one comment on procedure to think about. Um, yes. After you entertain friendly amendments, then there yes. actually is a formal amendment option after the motion is stated, then there can be a formal amendment which people vote on. Right. And then we do the final vote. That was right. not, I don't right. think we have, with only four of us, you don't I know. Them. And that's what I was looking at my notes for the formal motion to amend, because that's what I was thinking. OK, am I doing a formal motion to amend or am I just doing a friendly amendment? But we're, what we were actually voting on was just the approval of the plan. So, you know, um, yeah. Yeah. And that and and yeah. And it's also possible to make a series of of motions, right? Yes. Yes. Possible. Yes. And then we could actually um, go back to the beginning if we make a formal motion amend to, to wipe the slate clean and then sort of bundle all the things into one and then vote on that kind of thing if that situation occurred. But I'd rather not get into such a, a tangle to begin with if possible. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, thank you all again. Mm. Great job, team. Yes, yes. And thank you, Mr. Thay. And thank uh, Lillian also for arranging the special meeting so quickly. Um, as we requested. So appreciate thank, it. Thank you all for uh, making it tonight and uh, yep. <laughs> making this happen. Yep, it. yep. Looking forward to seeing what happens. Me too. Thanks a lot. <laughs> you guys have Good a great night. night. Bye. Good night. Good night.